So, so we're going to talk today, obviously, uh, tailings. And what I want to do with this presentation is to give you a good understanding of the tailings facility design and the selection of the best available technology, but I'm not really here to talk about the assessment that's been done as part of the EA application. The other scientists that have been brought in to do that third party independent review and analysis will be better to speak, or the ones that should really speak, to the studies that they have done. So the TSF design, just to, to give you a, a quick orientation, this is the main embankment, uh, the north northwest embankment, there's an east embankment here, and then uh, ultimately at the end of the mine there's a small embankment uh, in this location on the southeast. The facility's been designed to, to provide storage in a means that contains the tailings in a safe manner, uh, reduces or controls any of the seepage from the tailings, and provides a, a means there we can store the tailings during the life of the mine and then close it in a manner that would allow for a, a suitable post-mining land use that's very similar to the uses of the land that occur today. This figure illustrates how the embankment will be constructed over time. So we'll start with uh, a small starter embankment and on the face of that is a, a soil liner, compacted till liner that's the, uh, the zone that prevents water from moving through the embankment. And we will start uh, the buttressing process by adding fill or, or mine rock to buttress that initial starter dam to make it more secure. Initially, water will be stored against the face of the embankment. And then as we begin spigoting the tailings along the face of the embankment, that water pool moves further and further and further away from the embankment as the facility grows over time. We'll raise the embankment uh, about every two to three years, typically. We'll do an embankment raise. So this material gets placed and compacted, and then as, it, as the facility goes up, it ultimately moves out over that material until ultimately we have the, the final embankment. As we're building that embankment, we'll also be placing additional mine rock as a buttress. And the buttress is important, as we all Remember the unfortunate incident that occurred at Mount Polly in 2014. One of the aspects of that embankment that had been planned but not constructed was, was a buttress. And the buttress just shores up or strengthens the embankment to prevent it from failing. So a lesson learned from Mount Polly that we've applied at Ajax is a huge buttress. So this material here is the buttress and as you see, the buttress is actually bigger and higher than the embankment itself. So it's designed to provide a lot of additional strength to the embankment. Uh, just another uh, cross section showing the soil liner, how it will get keyed into the, to the soil in front of and beneath the embankment. The water stored against that initially and then pushed away as we add the tailings. And then these, this shows the different sequence of the raises over time until we get to the ultimate height of the embankment. So now we're looking down. Those were cross sections. Now we're looking down on the facility with the, uh, the starter dam for that north embankment here and a little bit in this area and then a little starter dam for the east embankment here. And this shows the tailings spigoted in year one that are moving that water pool away from the embankment. So I'll move through these fairly quickly, but it just shows the progression or the growth of the facility over time, this being the year two of operation. This is year 10, where you see now we've got the majority of that north embankment constructed, the buttress here behind it, east embankment and buttress. And this would be the final configuration or how the embankment would look as we uh, near the end of the mine life and go into the reclamation and closure of the facility. Buttress all the way around on the north embankment, fully buttressing the east. And then this, this small embankment to the southeast 
is bounded by topography. There's nothing can escape. There's a higher ground behind it. And that's also the case in this area where there's a, a higher topography or sloping up from the embankment further away. As we looked at uh, the Mount Polly incident, the, the findings of that panel review investigation was that a project needs to determine what is the best available technology for manning the, managing their tailings. And as we looked at Ajax, where we had initially planned a dry stack and then moved that away because of the proximity of the Coquihalla and the community, moved from dry stack to a conventional tailings, uh, because of concerns over lights and noise and dust and, and some technology challenges. We then revisited that decision and we worked through a process with our third party engineers to look at what is the best available technology for Ajax. I guess here the slide uh, talks about uh, the, the different technologies we looked at, dry stack, paste, uh, thickened tailings as well as the, uh, the conventional was, that was initially uh, designed when we moved to the south arrangement. There's a, a wide range of areas that were assessed to determine best available technology and you see the key areas here of the uh, technology, environmental and social considerations, economic, and then the project risk. So building this matrix and working through a process, our design engineers determined that the thickened tailings with that very large buttress was the best available technology for Ajax. And this just kind of shows those four different technologies that were evaluated and how they change or how they relate to each other. So this is the conventional where you would have a slurry that pumps the tailings out to the facility that has about 30% solids. So a really thick, muddy water that gets pumped to the tailings. When we thicken that slurry, the percent solids almost doubles. It goes from 30% or it does double. It goes from 30% to 60% in a process that we call a thickener. And we add a polymer in and it, it reduces the amount of water in the tailings that are deposited initially in the facility. Next technology is, is paste, and it, with a paste, which is another thickener, but a little different design and longer duration and more effort, you can get a paste, which is a, the 75% solids. And if we change technology and use a filtering process, we can reduce the moisture content in the tailings to 85%, and that's what is, was considered a, the dry stack, where you actually haul that material and place it as a soil. We also looked at various alternatives in addition to the technology and the, and the buttress. We looked at uh, locations. We wanted to know what the best location was and we've done what we call siting studies to find that optimum location for the facility. And several of these studies have been done over the past uh, probably five, five years going back to 2010. The reason that we look at our alternatives is that we want to, to be able to build the facility and operate it in the location that provides the least environmental impacts. And initially it was too close to the city in the Coquihalla and there was a lot of concerns. And so the siting, second siting study found a location further away from the community that reduced those environmental and social impacts. So we, as we look at, at the various options and we, we listen to the community and, and we retain these engineers to do the, the third party design, an important part of that effort is looking at the, the most environmentally friendly, if you will, option and looking at what works best as far as managing those tailings over the long term. Economics are, are a consideration, there's no doubt about that, but typically what we try to do with those analysis is to reduce the environmental and social impacts. So some of the alternatives that were considered, initially we had the north arrangement that we talked about very close to the city, the Coquihalla Highway. Uh, we looked at various technologies that we discussed 
And then also design considerations, which ultimately pushed us to the buttress for the embankment. And then uh, we've looked at various pit configurations and tried to minimize the impacts, especially to, to Jocko Lake and Peterson Creek, but yet still have a viable mining operation. And here you see the original north arrangement with the dry stack tailings. Uh, this was a, a mine rock storage facility, low grade ore processing facility. And in this area, there was a mine rock storage facility. <gasps> As we moved them to the south and went with the, uh, what's now the thickened tailings and buttressed facility, uh, mine rock storage facility, the, the pit, there's a crusher right on the edge of the pit, a conveyor up to the process facility and the uh, processing in this area. And this, uh, what we call the East Mine Rock Storage Facility, we changed the activity there to reduce the amount of mine rock that's being stored. And it's primarily used now for overburden and topsoil that will be used in the reclamation of the mine. Uh, look just a little more on, the, on why we moved um, and moved away from the dry stack. Uh, not really a proven technology at the throughput that Ajax is planning of 65,000 tons per day. And there is a lot of activity to haul those tailings and, and to place them. The bulk of the locations that were evaluated as part of that siting study with uh, the far north location here, uh, dry stack, and there were multiple configurations. Uh, another location here, excuse me, this was, this was on the old Afton tailings facility and how could it be potentially modified for either dry stack or conventional type or thickened tailings. Um, another location here still in that Cherry Creek drainage but further up. Uh, the dry stack facility as it was originally envisioned here. The tailings facility where it exists today here and then some other locations that were evaluated as far as possible locations. Ultimately, it was determined that this location with the thickened tailings and the buttressed embankments was the best location uh, for Ajax to manage the tailings. As a part of the design work, our engineers looked at a dam breach study. So in the unlikely event that the embankment was to fail, what would that look like? What would, what would happen? And because of the very large buttress, the, the engineers determined that that embankment won't fail. The software that they use and the methods that they use to do the dam breach analysis said that it won't fail because of the very large buttress. But there was other potential failure mechanisms that they came up with, and they used a staged approach, uh, screening level, then they did the potential failure modes analysis and then the ultimate dam breach and inundation study. And in each one of those stages, they would, would look at the potential failure modes. And this is just a quick summary of the different uh, modes that they looked at. So this would be the stage of the embankment as far as the time, the elevation, and then the uh, the contents, water only initially, and then with tailings. And then the three main embankments, the north, east, and south. And then the scenarios that they ran to see if there was potential for that embankment to fail and what the consequences would be. Ultimately, from those scenarios that they determined that the, the one, I think there was three critical failure analysis. One would be seepage only moving through the, uh, the north embankment and then the, uh, the south or on that west side there was a potential for a failure in an area that was not buttressed but it was bounded by topography and so that tailings only travels a, a fairly short distance and then it's contained by that higher elevation behind the embankment. This just talks about the, uh, the consequence categories that they, uh, that they utilized as part of the analysis. So the, uh, the startup analysis in year one, when it's just water against the embankment, there's potential for that water to move through and have kind of a seepage failure through the embankment. 
and they determined that that water would be captured in the seepage ponds below and, uh, and have a minimal impact downstream. Um, another analysis with the uh, tailings now against the embankment, the water further away, and uh, with the buttressing here, again, there was no, no real failure, but the potential for seepage moving through the, uh, in, through the embankment. The area where there was the potential for failure was this embankment here, where there's no buttress and the uh, inundation area is about this large where the tailings could potentially uh, inundate an area if the embankment were to fail. And this is just a little more detail on the, the seepage through the embankment, cases one and two. The uh, structural failure here that we talked about and the area that would be inundated. One of the important aspects or things that we consider as we design a facility is how it will ultimately be reclaimed or closed and turning, returning that land to a suitable post-mining land use. And ultimately what will happen, this cross-section represents the tailings here. We'll put mine rock, uh, about a meter of mine rock above the tailings, then overburden of uh, about 0.65 meters and then topsoil, 0.35 meters of topsoil. And then we'll revegetate that area with, with grasses similar to what the, the grasses that you currently see in the area, native grasses. And this is the, the plan view of the facility. We'll have drainage that will drain across the facility this way through a cut and then into uh, to, uh, and Anderson Creek? Humphrey. Humphreys Creek, Humphrey. thank you. Humphrey. Humphreys Creek. Okay. Back to Mike for, for questions now, I believe. Yeah, that was it. So we've got to get 25 minutes uh, for questions. So go ahead, sir. You had cross sections of the dam construction? Yes. Can you pull up that slide again? Sure can. Where is this? Whoops, this piece. Does it occur on the outside of the dam all the way around? Well, it, yes, it occurs. So the dam itself is this, a downstream and construction of the dam. Where does this occur, on the east dam or the west dam? So please allow me to answer your question. I understand your question. So this buttress occurs all the way around on the north and west sides and on the east embankment. How much weight is pushing down? Do you have a, a square meter and so much weight? How much weight is pushing down on the ground with all this added water and tailings and, and waste rock to construct the ground? Yeah, I, I don't that would take some time to calculate Why that are those weight. numbers available to us? That's, <laughs> so we, can, we can get those, but that's not a typical thing you do in the design, but we could come up with a number. The pipeline in Sumas had a pipe moved by somebody putting excess of their permit on the ground, and it moved the pipeline and caused a leak. You've got the dam running parallel to the pipeline for quite a ways there, and you cannot put a 750 buttress, meter buttress, like they are working on up at Highland Valley Copper, anywhere on that west. So, sir, uh, he doesn't have those answers available right can, now, but if you can, can follow you up. Can you get them to us, please? I can get you the, the uh, density that you ask, or the loading on the soil. I can also tell you that as far as the pipeline, the proposed reroute of the pipeline, which I think that's what you're talking about. Um, yeah around here, I can get you that, uh, we, I can assure you that we are working with our geotechnical engineers and the Kinder Morgan geotechnical engineers to evaluate the stability of that proposed re yeah, I'd, I'd like to cut it off of that because there's a woman waiting patiently behind you. There's no kilometer scale on there. Have you got one, one question, yeah. ma'am. Okay. Okay. Um, 
I've got a bunch of questions. Some of them are, are sort of pretty well, easy. Well, hold things. on. I'm going to just want to warn people then. If there's nobody behind you, that's okay. But if you have questions, it'll be one at a time. Okay. Anybody else wants um, to? The buttressing, um, it's going to be massive. From the east, say from Highway 5A, how high is the buttress going to be um, at its highest? The buttress at the highest point is about 160 meters from the lowest point in the valley up to the crest of the buttress. Okay, I'm going to have to leave it at that because you do have somebody behind you. So feel free to line up again. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Jackal Lake is near us. And Jackal Lake was a small lake until a couple of dams were built by ranchers about 100 years ago. Now, if those Jackal Lake dams fail, how would that impact your tailing storage facility or your mine project? <coughs> Has that been looked at, the, the risk of the existing Jackal Lake dams? Yes, the, so it would not, if those dams were to fail, it would not affect the tailings facility. They are downstream but there could be a potential effect on the pit. And so we have looked at that in both the uh, accidents and malfunctions and the, uh, the work that was done on Jackal Lake. Okay, ma'am, go ahead, one question. Okay, um, back to the, the buttressing. Um, is there a possibility that will have waste mine rock? That's gonna, what's formed the buttress? It is mine rock. It is mine rock. It, can there be leaching from the mine rock? So just into the, the soil in the area, so there, on the other side of the buttress? There's been an extensive evaluation of the geochemistry done as a part of the EA application, and I would encourage you to, to visit with Bruce, and, and he can walk through the, how that mine rock material has been characterized and what those uh, acid potential, acid generation potential, neutralization potential, metals mobilization, the full analysis that, ha that has been done as part of the EA application. Um, Bruce, what's Bruce's last name? Matson. Matson with uh, Lorax. Okay. And is he here tonight? Like I don't believe sessions? he's here tonight. I think he might be here tomorrow. Okay. Well, we can get that contact info to you. Okay. Hey, yes, sir. One question, please. The particulate size of the uh, the white the beaches. The tailings. Uh, is it cons consistent all the way through to the bottom of the reservoir you might say? It's, it's relatively consistent um, that those tailings are going to be the consistency somewhere between sugar and flour and there is some segregation between the initial spigot point and the tail of the beach where the coarser material settles out initially and the fines further down the beach but there's not a huge difference. It's all, it's all like sugar and flour. Very fun and very attracted to wind. Okay, air, air quality is our next session. <coughs> so we've got two people who haven't asked questions behind you. But feel free to line up again. We've got another 19 minutes. Yes, sir, go ahead. Normally, there is a certain amount of seepage that occurs from a killings dam. Is there any provision for collecting any of that seepage with collection bonds? or wells or whatever? Yes, we do have a seepage collection system and there are seepage collection ponds um, in two drainages downstream of the north embankment. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, you mentioned a number of factors that went into the change in the tailing storage uh, concept. Um, one of them being that it didn't, uh, the dry stack wasn't capable of, of supporting the throughput of the mine, if it's not capable at this point, why was it considered to be capable at the outset? Well, it, it's, uh, so the challenge with it is that it's a proven technology up to about 20,000 tons per day, dry stacks used fairly commonly. To make that jump to 65,000 tons per day, that scale up factor can be considerable. It can be, create a lot of issues. And so that's why this round it was uh, it was eliminated or it was scored very low because of the technology challenges. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, how long in time 
would this tailing storage facility be in operation and then become sort of something that's not containing liquids and just be a solid thing up on the hill? So the operation will be between 18 and 23 years where it will be operated. Then there's a five-year reclamation and closure period. And then it will return to a somewhat natural state in perpetuity. That's how it will be. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. One uh, question, please. You mentioned that uh, a, a reclamation that something will be going into Humphrey Creek, which feeds into Peterson. So what will be going into Humphrey Creek? Well, initially the water that's contained in the, so if we jump to a later drawing here, initially this water that's contained in the facility will get pumped to the open pit. We'll then place the cover that we talked about, the mine rock, the overbird, and the topsoil. We'll revegetate it, and we'll continue to pump water to the pit until that water quality running off of the facility meets the water quality guidelines. Once it meets the water quality guidelines, it will then be released to Humphrey Creek. And it will be monitored over time? One at a time, please. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Um, moving massive weights of rock has been shown to have a seismic effect on the area. And I, um, I, I think that because of our location, um, if a big one happens on the coast, it's still going to affect us some. And I wondered if there's been any work to sort of examine the seismic effects of the mine and what might happen if, if there is a, a, a large uh, quake away from us. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. And there was a very detailed seismic study done to determine what the largest um, event that could occur in the closest proximity to the facility and then that determines the ground movement, what we call the peak horizontal ground acceleration of the ground movement at the facility associated with that event. And then the engineers have designed the facility to withstand that ground movement so there would be no impact with the, uh, with the largest anticipated event of ground movement. Okay, yes sir. The seepage that was mentioned by this gentleman, uh, after the mine's been closed down, there could still be seepage lurking because it's just looking for a way out. Five years after a 23-year operation is no big deal. That, um, Mount Polly was seeping for 17 years before it showed up to the daylight. What are you going to do about that? Well, that's a really good question. And as part of the assessment in the EA application, a groundwater flow model was built and uh, Trevor is here with uh, BGC, and he can explain that in great detail to you about what happens with that seepage over time. Generally, it goes to the pit. One at a time, okay. Um, keeping in mind, folks, we've got about 15 minutes left in this session, but this session will repeat again three more times tonight and four times tomorrow, so there's lots of opportunity. But if you do have a question, feel free to line up uh, at the mic. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with a seismic question, um, seeing as how Aberdeen already is an unstable area, um, that it may uh, have, has there been any study on how it might affect the instability in Aberdeen uh, when they did the seismic study? Well, the, the seismic study determined the, the ground movement that we anticipate. In the EA application, several of the studies considered Aberdeen for various reasons. For the, for the instability that you talk about in Aberdeen, we looked at noise and vibration, would be there be any impact? We looked at the groundwater flow, would there be any impact? And I would encourage you to go to those specialists that did those studies and, and ask those questions and let them explain yeah, what their results Yeah, I just asked you about a, a seismic effect and you said uh, that that is considered, that was considered. Well, um, did you not consider uh, how such a movement might affect an already unstable area where a huge number of houses are? Well, our study and our analysis was for our project. We didn't, we didn't study Aberdeen. 
other than potential impacts to it. Okay, thank you, sir. So 200 folks in line, got about 10 minutes or so left. If there's any other questions, go ahead. Uh, bird life has been a difficulty with some tailing storage facilities keeping the birds away. How do you propose to do that here? Well, the water in this facility um, is relatively good water quality. It's actually better water quality than what's currently in Goose Lake. So based on that, we didn't see a need to have protective measures. But if in the event that that water quality is worse than what's predicted and we need to come up with measures, there are many of them out there, as, as you probably know. It seems like you're familiar with that to a degree. But there's, there's cannons and there's balls and there's netting and there's many, many things that can be used if needed to keep birds out of the water. So as it stands, the birds won't be harmed if they land? The water quality, that, as we understand it and what our, our studies show, is that it's good enough it won't harm them. Okay, thank you. Okay, whoever's next, next question. Uh, I kind of wondered, like the, uh, the, the problem I have is that the changes are forever. And uh, 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 forever changes that are beside 90,000 people uh, is kind of a special case. And I wondered if, uh, for instance, we should be looking at uh, uh, climate change, for instance, or possible climate change. Has there been any studies of the effect of, uh, um, you know, say, increased precipitation here, which might well come from climate change? Yes, there is a, a chapter in the EA application on impacts of the environment to the project, and those things are addressed. And uh, that's not what we're talking about here, but I can assure you it has, and um, maybe Nettie can find the right person to talk to that, as well as uh, greenhouse gases were also. You're saying that the storage, Sir, that the storage has, uh, has uh, or that uh, increased precipitation is not going to change the tailings and the management of the tailings? Well, if you're asking specifically about the water management strategy for tailings facility, that tailings facility has been designed to an extreme event. And yes, those extreme events have been considered as far as how to manage the facility, assure that there's adequate freeboard that it doesn't overtop, and how to capture runoff from the facilities, uh, the tailings facility and other facilities that are part of the project. Okay, thank you, sir. Next question. Very often during the life of a mine, the ore reserves are increased due to exploration or bringing in additional ore. Has any provision been made in the design of your dam as to whether or not you can increase the size of it to include additional ore or not? There's currently about 40 million tons of additional capacity above what we anticipate processing. We didn't go any further to look at how it could potentially be expanded if additional uh, reserves are found. But that, you're right, that's very common for a mining operation. Okay, so uh, about seven or eight minutes left, if anybody else has any questions. Okay. Uh, the visual impact of this tailing storage facility, um, can you answer those questions or do I need to talk to you about your visual impact? experts on that. Well, it would be best to talk to them I was just about wondering their if, of how much of this would be visible from Kamloops, for example. Well, I don't think anything from Kamloops, but the, the ones that did those studies would be best okay. to talk to them. Right, thank you. And if we can find that information out. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the team that studied Mount Pauly made a statement that uh, earth dams uh, will fail eventually. Is that a correct statement? Well, I'm not familiar with that statement. Okay. Um, I, I do know that there are many of them around the world that operate successfully, so that it's not a given that they'll fail. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. It mentioned in the paper that KGHM was responsible for the old Afton tailings pond, and I've never seen it on any of the maps, and I'm wondering who I should talk to about it. I'm curious, Morning. 
Well, it's yeah. Be, we haven't included either on these maps. You're right, other than the siting study. Um, well, you included the hold, so I was wondering where the rest of the facility went. Well, the old Afton Tannings facility is is over at at the uh, new Afton mine. And oh, okay. uh, Kate, the short answer that Kate, Dr. Okay. Kate Kate Parsons, who's our environmental manager, I believe Kate is here today. She would be the best person to talk to about that old facility. Okay, so different than this study. Last call for any questions. Got a couple of minutes left. Hey, go ahead, sir. You added 40 million tons, 40 million tons uh, as extra. What is the tonnage that you're starting with that you're adding 40 million as an extra two? Well, the capacity of the impoundment is 440 million tons. 440, 440 million tons. And with the capacity for an additional 60 on top of that, 40. Well, the capacity is 440. We're currently planning to process about 400. Okay, thanks, Todd. Yes, ma'am, in, in the reclamation period, you talked about native grasses on top of the tailings, but will you be doing the same over the buttressing, all the rock piles? Yes, yes, they'll be regraded. The slopes will be flattened to a stable slope and topsoil, overburden and topsoil placed on them and then revegetated, yes. Last call for any questions. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to thank Clive Gillespie for uh, doing the presentation and taking the questions. I'd like to thank you folks for coming out and asking questions and uh, being informed. And on behalf of the uh, BC Environmental Assessment Office and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, uh, thanks very much to the ones that are hosting this. And again, the public comment period is open until April 11th, where it's a 75-day period that started at the end of January. And again, to be, um, for your comments to be considered, you've got to submit them in, in writing. That can either be on paper or online, to one or the other, and it all goes into the same uh, comment pot, and it will all be considered. So thanks very much, everybody. If uh, you have uh, further questions, there's lots of people out in the hall, and this will repeat itself again at 5.30. Thank you. Thank you.